Dear brothers and sisters, when we look through the stories that come from the nations that precede the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the nation of Musa alayhi salam, the nation of Jesus, peace be upon him, the nation of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the nation of all of these prophets and messengers that came before, each one of them had a set of circumstances and companions or disciples or followers, as well as good and bad that was found in their ummah. And many times we find stories in the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam in his narrations that tell us about some of these stories, either that we, we may follow the example of a good person that has preceded one of the awliya, the righteous, pious servants of Allah, or to avoid the footsteps and the traps that those who preceded us fell into either collectively or as individuals in some of the narrations that we find. So it's an interesting cluster of narrations that we find in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly about the monks from Bani Israel, about a person who would be called a rahib, which the most appropriate translation would be a monk, a person who is a abid, a worshiper, particularly dedicated to the temple or dedicated to what would denote a masjid at the time, a place of worship. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us about how some of these monks went astray. And he tells us about some of the success stories, some of the righteous ubad of Bani Israel, some of the righteous worshippers of Bani Israel. Amongst the most famous stories of a monk that preceded us, a monk from Bani Israel, one of the worshippers of Bani Israel, is the famous story Barsisa. And that's not the topic of my khutbah, those of you that have heard the narration. Barsisa, and I'll quickly paraphrase his story, is an example of a monk who was trapped by the devil and then went wrong. He was a righteous man, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, a righteous monk, a worshipper who dedicated himself uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some brothers went on a journey to travel and they entrusted him with their sister. And so they built a, uh, a home or they, or they put her in a home right across from the masjid, right across from where he would worship. And every day he would slowly, slowly get more attached to her. So he'd take food to her and then slowly he would get closer to her. And again, he started to develop these emotions and then those emotions led to more contact and flirtation. And then he committed zina, he committed adultery. When he committed adultery, the girl became pregnant. And so shaitan came to him and instead of owning the mistake that he made, Barsisa kept, to di kept digging himself deeper into the hole that he made for himself. So shaitan presented to him this idea that you need to kill the baby, you need to do away with the evidence here that there was zina, so he, he kills the baby. Then shaitan comes to him and tells him, well, what, how do you know that she's not going to talk? So he kills her too and buries her away from the site. And then when the brothers come home, he tells the brothers that she died a natural death, inna lillah wa ilayhi raji'oon. And he thought that he had covered up all of his tracks and he thought that he was successful in escaping this situation. Next thing you know, the shaitan discloses to these brothers in a dream what happens. And subhanAllah, this man ends up being crucified by his people, not before the shaitan coming to him once again and telling him, I'm the one who got you in this mess. I can get you out of it. Prostrate to me, do sujood to me, and I will get you out of it. He goes down and he makes sajda to the shaitan. He prostrates to the devil. This man who spent his entire life in worshiping Allah, makes this prostration to the devil after committing adultery and murder of two people at this point. And shaitan turns his back on him and says, Inni bari un mink, I have nothing to do with you. I declare my innocence of your crime. A sad story with many lessons in it. A man who went down a dangerous track. Then there's another story that's less known. And this is the one that's the subject of the khutbah. Uh, and obviously, again, there are many lessons we can take from the story of Barsisa alone. The greatest of them that in this situation, number one, he followed the footsteps of shaitan. Number two, he remained in the web of shaitan once, once he recognized he was caught. He did not escape it once that consciousness came back to him. Instead, he continued to dig the hole 
deeper that he made for himself in the first place. There's another story. That one has a certain ending and this one is a lesser known narration which I found quite fascinating. It's a narration in Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba from Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says radiallahu ta'ala anhu anna rahi ban abad Allah fi salma'atihi sitina sana. There was a man, a rahib, a monk, who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his temple for 60 years. Once again, this person who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a long time. The delusion that could happen to this person is a delusion that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned happened to some men that used to worship Allah exclusively their entire lives, which is that they start to become arrogant and they start to think that their worship makes them immune to sin. And even if they have shortcomings, then they can still lean on the amount of worship, the, the huge amount of worship that they have put forth before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a disease that can happen. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned another narration. A man who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hundreds of years. And then when the angel came to him, he, the, he, he said to the angel as the angel told him to enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah, he said, I want to enter Jannah by my amal, by my good deeds. Why the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala weighed the blessing of his eyesight, his basar, with his hundreds of years of worship. And the eyesight, the one blessing of eyesight weighed more than all of those hundreds of years. And so he was about to go to hell and then he pleaded for Allah's mercy and he entered by Allah's mercy. So the delusion, the ghurur that could happen to any one of us, this is a message to the Jum'ah crowd. This is a message to the regular musallim. That you might now think of people that don't come to the masjid, they don't do what you do, and think, well, alhamdulillah, I'm not that bad. That's the first problem. You should be thinking of them that there is some good perhaps that you're not seeing. And then there's some bad in yourself that is maybe being masked by our participation in these public acts of worship. So number one, a humility. So we go back to the narration. أَنَّ رَجُلًا عَبَدَ اللَّهَ فِي صَلْمَاعَتِهِ سَتِينَ سَنَةً This rahab, this monk worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 60 years in one place. فَجَاءَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ فَنَزَلَتْ إِلَى جَنْبِهِ فَنَزَلَ إِلَيْهَا فَوَقَاعَهَا سِتَّ لَيَالٍ so a woman uh, came in his presence and he started to develop an attachment to this woman and he ended up uh, committing zina, ended up committing adultery with her and he stayed in that state for six nights. So the narration actually explicitly mentions that this happened for almost an entire week. Now what happened to this man as he came to that realization? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Whenever these people of taqwa, people of piety are seized by the shaitan for a moment, a day, a few hours, a week. But then suddenly, tadakkaru. Suddenly, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ And their eyes are wide and they're paying attention now. And they say, how did this happen? How did I get myself in this? It happens to the best of us. What, where am I? How could I have fallen like this? So this man was not caught. The woman was not pregnant. He could have simply said, you know, disappear and let's pretend this never happened. And worried about the people that would find out. Instead, look at the sincerity of his tawbah, the man himself woke up. And so the man, as the, as the narration continues, that after he committed that deed, he then went, ثُمَّ سَقَطَ فِي يَدِهِ فَهَرَبَ فَأَتَى مَسْجِدًا He ran away. But where did he go? Where are you going to run away from? You're going to run away from a masjid? You're going to run away from the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So where is that man going to go? Did he go home? Did he go to, to a friend's house? No. He went to another masjid. Atta masjid. Which is a very smart move. He understood, لا مَلْجَأَ وَلَا مَنْجَأَ مِنْكَ إِلَّا إِلَيْكَ You don't escape from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to start over and I need to beg Allah for forgiveness, but I need to get out of here. So he went from his own masjid, the one that he used to worship Allah in, to another masjid. And the narration continues, فَآوَى إِلَيْهِ فَمَكَ ثَلَاثَةً لَا يَطْعَمُ شَيْئًا So he went to that masjid 
and he took residence in that masjid for three days and he did not eat anything for three entire days. It's not that he was starving himself. It's not that he was trying to commit suicide. It's that he was so immersed in his repentance that he was not even eating or drinking. He wasn't paying attention to his food and his drink, which is a testimony to the man's sincerity in this, in this case. He felt so bad about it, he wasn't even paying attention to his food and drink. So as the hadith continues, you think about this man sitting in the masjid now for three nights, crying over what he committed for six nights, not even thinking about the 60 years that preceded those six nights. Because right now, those six nights obscured all of those years of worship to him, begging Allah for forgiveness. So some people noticed him in the masjid. And so they brought to him a raghif. They brought to him a loaf of bread. And they told him, Ya Fulan, oh so and so, you haven't eaten, go ahead and eat your bread. So the narration says that the man took that, فَكَسَرَ نِصْفَهُ He broke the bread into two pieces. فَأَعْطَى نِصْفَهُ رَجْلًا عَلْ يَمِينَ وَأَعْطَى الْآخَرَ he gave one half of it to someone on his right, one half of it to someone on his left, and the man continued to immerse himself in seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that very moment, at that very moment, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Allah sent the angel of death in that moment to him and took his soul. So he died in the masjid, in a state of repentance, the place where he started. But the narration gets really, really interesting in the end. And by the way, it's a sahih narration. Sahihahu al-Imam al-Albani was Sheikh Shakir. It's a very powerful narration and it's an authentic one. Listen to what he continues to say. He says, فَوُضِعَ عَمَلُ السِّتِينَ سَنَةَ فِي kiffa." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his 60 years of worship on one side of a scale. And Allah put that six nights of adultery on the other side. The six nights were heavier than his 60 years of worship. The Prophet Allah mentions, don't void your charity. Sometimes, Charity, good deeds can be voided. So those six nights voided his 60 years. But then what happens to him? The Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ جِيَ بِالْرَغِيف Allah brought forth that piece of bread and then put the bread on one side of the scale with his six nights of sin. فَرَجَحَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ And so the raghif the bread outweighed his six nights of adultery and entered him into Jannah. 